Welcome everybody to ICMDA webinars and today's topic is an occupational physician's perspective on COVID-19 and our speaker is Dr. Simon Clift. Now, Dr. Simon Clift, who I've had the pleasure to know for, for many years, Simon is a consultant in occupational health, occupational medicine in the UK with additional training in travel medicine and public health. And he has 18 years of experience providing specialist occupational and travel health services to missionaries, church leaders, and also aid workers working for InterHealth until its closure in 2017, and more recently now under the auspices of a new organization called Thrive Worldwide. Prior to this, Simon lived with his family in Tanzania as mission partners with Crosslinks, which is an Anglican mission agency. And uh, he's an active member of his local church and sits on the General Synod of the Church of England as well. So uh, Simon, over to you, an occupational physician's perspective on COVID-19, uh, over to you, thank you. Thank you, Peter, very much. Yes, a, a great privilege to be with you today and to be part of this ICMDA webinar. I was just working out, I've been a, a CMF, Christian Medical Fellowship member for about 39 years. And so it is a, a great joy to be a part of this webinar with you. Um, I'm coming at this from uh, inevitably from a UK perspective, but um, I'm uh, conscious of the international nature of this webinar. Uh, uh, and so I will try where possible to think of it uh, what I'm saying in the wider context. Uh, and particularly, I would welcome comments and questions from you. I'm really looking forward to that part of the webinar where you, you uh, bring ideas and questions from your own context. I think that's going to be very helpful and very rich uh, as we go through this material. So hopefully you can see my first slide. Uh, uh, before I move on, uh, I, I came into occupational medicine um, convinced of two things. So occupational medicine, uh, the, the specialist area of medicine where you're looking at the interaction between work and health. I came at it convinced about two things. One, about the power of good work of the right kind of work as a driver towards good health and well-being. I also came at it convinced that being out of work, particularly for long periods of time, is a disaster in terms of health and well-being. And uh, in my training, they used to say that it's as hazardous to be out of work without work as it is to be working on an offshore oil platform. Uh, I think that reflects the fact that we're all made in God's image. God, the creator, makes us in his image. And so we're created for a purpose to create, to produce, to manage, to steward uh, the world's resources. And that's fundamentally what good work is all about. So. In the context of COVID-19, uh, I see this as a potential threat to the world of work, to people's livelihoods, to people's ability to work safely and productively. It's not a traditional work hazard like a, a chemical that might be a poison or a physical hazard uh, that causes back problems or neck problems or even a psychological hazard like work-related stress but it is a, a hazard all the same that needs to be managed. So at the end of December 2019 there was the very first case of, of COVID-19 was reported. We're now six months on and there are very nearly uh, 12 million cases reported worldwide with uh, over a half a million deaths attributable to COVID-19. This uh, uh, picture 
uh, with the size of the of the red circles gives you an idea of the cumulative cases across the world and you you notice the concentration in Europe uh, and in North America uh, and to a lesser extent in South Asia particularly India but it doesn't give you a feel of, of what's currently happening and I'll give you a chance just to have a look at these individual uh, diagrams but uh, this gives us a bit more of an idea of what's happening currently and this is very important so this is looking at a number of different countries and their daily new cases of COVID-19. The uh, x-axis is the same for all, so it's, it's running over time uh, from February right to the current time. The y-axis, the scale that alters, but you still get the idea of the shape of the curve. There are a number of things to notice. The bottom right-hand corner are the daily new cases in South Korea. And this would be an example of a number of other countries in Southeast Asia where after an initial surge of cases, cases are almost uh, reduced to zero uh, thanks to very impressive public health measures. The United Kingdom in the top of the middle is uh, very similar, the curve there, to uh, most countries in Europe, in the rest of Europe, which have seen a peak of cases, but because of stringent public health measures, particularly social distancing, uh, the numbers have got down to a lot more lower uh, daily levels. I put the other uh, curves in because actually, uh, first of all, the United States bottom left is a warning to those countries that have seen control of, and a, a reduction in numbers the ever-present risk of a, a, a resurgence of numbers that's being seen in the United States at the moment. And the curves for South Africa, India and Brazil represent whole swathes of the world's population that are still seeing an ever-increasing number of COVID-19 cases. What many parts of the world are trying to, to uh, focus on is how to prevent a second wave. Of course, many parts of the country are still navigating an initial first wave. It's clear from uh, prevalence, zero prevalence uh, surveillance uh, uh, that the background prevalence, even in countries where there have been lots of cases, is still very low, 5, 10, 15 percent perhaps. To get any kind of herd immunity, we need at least 70% prevalence of, of immunity of, of protected antibody levels. So it's, there's little doubt that uh, in countries where the numbers have gone down to a very small number, that if the current measures are released uh, and people go back to living as they were before the, the pandemic, uh, there's nothing stopping a resurgence of numbers and that's of particular concern right across the world. David Nabarro, who's the WHO Special Envoy, said this, it hasn't gone away talking about COVID-19. We need to go on taking the virus seriously. And that's a challenge for all of us in our different contexts. some very fundamental pieces of information about the transmission of the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. You'll be familiar with droplet spread, environmental contact, but even over the last few days, there's been an increasing conversation uh, about airborne transmission. And I think we're going to hear about this in the coming weeks. The risk of transmission airborne where where large groups of people are meeting for or being present for long periods in confined spaces and that's going to be something that that right across the globe we need to be thinking about as one aspect of what we need to do if we're going to bring about a control of COVID-19. The other point I want to raise from this graph uh, that this slide is the infectious period, which is up to two days before 
before the onset of symptoms. And the graph on the bottom right illustrates that in a, a model, a model of what happens. In fact, suggesting that people are even more infectious before they first start having symptoms. It reminds me of the idea of universal precautions that we used to talk about and we still do in terms of HIV AIDS transmission, that we can't um, uh, only uh, take measures where someone is clearly uh, infected. We need to use universal precautions, assuming that anyone might have the virus. It's the same with COVID-19. And that's important in terms of occupational health and public health. The idea of hazard and risk is fundamental to occupational medicine. A hazard is something that can cause harm. Uh, the coronavirus is a hazard. Risk, though, is the chance that that hazard will actually cause somebody harm. And uh, what we need to do is to think how we uh, manage uh, the hazard in order to minimize the risk. And a very helpful concept is the idea of hierarchy of controls. You see that illustrated by the diagram in the bottom right hand corner that just shows you in a pictorial way that uh, there are some measures that are most effective uh, and uh, there are some measures that are uh, the, the least effective. And so uh, also when we think about controlling for COVID-19, are there measures that we can do that put a great deal of distance between ourselves and the virus? That would be the most effective way of managing it. And only uh, once we've done all these uh, more effective measures uh, should we be thinking about PPE, personal protective equipment? Of course, when we think about uh, risk management, we're not talking about eliminating all risk. We're talking about reducing it to an acceptable uh, level uh, or the lowest reasonably practical level. And clearly, depending on your context, uh, you might come to a different decision about what's an acceptable level of risk. If you are in a context where you're surrounded by all sorts of other risks, perhaps even the risk of a lack of food security or other um, hazards that are actually far more pressing on the population than even COVID-19, you're going to come up perhaps with a different uh, way of managing the risk of COVID-19. The last point here is important though, because this is a new phenomenon, uh, we're managing uncertainty. And so the precautionary principle is fundamental. So from an occupational health perspective, there are four things that uh, I would talk about in terms of working safely during COVID-19. And I'll be interested to know your reflections on to what extent these are relevant in your context. The first in the UK is this idea of continuing to work from home where possible. Uh, there is a lot of work that happens in the UK that can be done remotely without someone being physically present in a place of work. But clearly that's not possible with many different professions, many different industries. Uh, and so I recognize that as a, a privilege that some workers have in the world, but not for others. Uh, in the UK, we talk about COVID secure workplaces. Uh, that is workplaces where uh, risks have been managed uh, to minimize the risk of individuals becoming infected in the workplace. Number three, the third point is the idea that some people are at higher risk than others. This is a, a, a fundamental concept within occupational medicine. It would be the same if you're uh, thinking about the hazard of noise, for example. You particularly want to protect those who already have hearing damage. 
um, uh, hearing impairment because for them, they're at higher risk of the consequences of the hazard. The fourth point is just the nature of many um, uh, um, workers that I uh, am involved with who are traveling internationally as part of their work. And so uh, for me to advise them about safe international travel is vital. So we're going to go through those one at a time. I recognize this as a slide that, that probably makes sense within some contexts and less relevant in others. I think uh, the social isolation of working from home um, that many people through the COVID pandemic have experienced uh, reminds me actually that uh, there are unexpected hazards that come about when we make changes to people's working environment. Uh, and the increase in uh, mental health problems as a result of the social isolation, the relative sensory deprivation of uh, working from home and being detached from your work colleagues is not to be underestimated. I think also we don't yet know the long term impact of people being isolated and working from home not only on themselves as individuals, but on the teams that they're part of or the effectiveness of the organizations they work uh, for. To what extent, if we're working remotely for long periods of time, is it possible to maintain the same levels of performance, of creativity, of team dynamics that are achievable when people are face to face in the same work environment? So the second part, making the workplace COVID secure. Well, there are four uh, basic aspects to this that are outlined there on the slide. And you can just take those in uh, as a moment's pause. So basically, we're looking to address each of the recognized means of transmission of the coronavirus and also to uh, seek to identify those who are more likely to be uh, infectious to other people within the workplace. So those who are known to be infected and those who have been in close contact with those who have been infected. Minimising droplet transmission. I think we underestimate the importance of personal hygiene measures in many countries in the West. Uh, many people in the UK live as though infection is really uh, not really a problem that they have to bother themselves with. I think some of you will laugh at that because you recognise that infections remain a significant threat to the health of populations and individuals. So in the UK, amusingly, people talk about cough etiquette. Uh, amazing to think that we have to do that. So putting uh, a, a cloth uh, over someone's mouth uh, when they're coughing. Uh, you might be interested in that link to the Germ Defence website. Uh, it's long been known that there are ways of reducing the risk of, of people having coughs and colds in the workplace by just attending to personal hygiene measures better. But the list there just shows you the, uh, the ability to be creative about different ways of reducing the risk of droplet transmission. What about changing the work environment so that there's less close contact between workers? What about thinking about shift work, uh, continuing a certain amount of working from home, of rotating staff in and out of the workplace? What about having one-way systems within your office or your factory? The use of perspex screens, uh, even the way that people are seated in the canteen or in their office. On top of that, there's the physical distance and the potential to wear visors or face masks. In the UK, Early on, it was decided that two metres was the appropriate distance between people if we wanted to reduce droplet transmission. Of course, 
I'm sure you'll be aware, but it's uh, uh, not a, a simple case of two meters is safe, under two meters is not safe. Uh, it's far more uh, sophisticated and complex than that. And so in the UK, we've started to talk about having one meter plus mitigation. It makes all the difference uh, if you're in close proximity to someone, whether you are back to back or face to face, for example, whether you're in the open air or whether you're in a small confined space without uh, any ventilation. So uh, the idea of just setting a, a limit in terms of distance is sensible because everyone knows where they are with it. But actually, it's only part of the equation if we think about managing risk. Environmental transmission. Uh, this is fundamental, given that it is possible for us to be infected by touching a surface that's been touched by someone with COVID-19, thus uh, putting our hands touching the virus and then uh, transferring the virus uh, to our uh, faces, perhaps our mucous membranes inside our mouth or our eyes or nose. It's probably less important uh, in terms of uh, overall transmission than the droplets, but it is there all the same. So how are we going to alter our working environment to minimise environmental transmission? There's some possibility of redesigning our workplaces and the inset is from uh, Toyota and all the ways that they were looking to reduce the risk of transmission in the workplace. But fortunately, simple cleaning and disinfection is extremely effective in controlling environmental transmission. And it doesn't take anything elaborate or expensive in terms of products. You might want to be increasing the frequency by which you clean surfaces, but you're using the same kind of uh, cleaning products that you've always used. So what about airborne transmission? This is really hot off the press, uh, but on the basis that we're not sure to what extent airborne transmission is key, we need to use the precautionary principle. And that's really, as, as you remember, talking about the hierarchy of controls, it's thinking of measures that right at the top of the pyramid um, and particularly building in engineering controls that can help reduce the risk of airborne transmission. Simple things like opening doors and windows or perhaps getting the engineer to come and modify your air conditioning system so that there is less recirculation of air and more fresh air being drawn in to the building. Uh, the potential for using portable air cleaning devices in some contexts, and particularly to think about how many people can safely be in the same indoor environment. It's not just about physical distance, but about the extent to which if we're in the same confined space, we share the same air. The next point is to have some means of excluding those who become unwell with COVID-19 and their close contacts. Uh, this is part of the approach. It's not the whole uh, approach. Uh, some workplaces use thermal screening, but as we know, many people who are positive uh, for the virus even have symptoms may not have a temperature so wouldn't be picked up by thermal screening which is expensive and difficult to put into operation. In some particular work contexts uh, people are being regularly tested for COVID-19 obviously within a healthcare setting but just today there's talk in the UK of people in high risk like taxi drivers or cleaners to be able to have regular testing of their COVID-19 status uh, as a one means of managing the transmission of COVID-19. This, uh, the next uh, few slides, uh, are, um, I want to spend a little time on to try and explain what um, this is all about. 
right at the beginning of the pandemic, it was clear that people who were older and those people who had pre-existing medical conditions seemed to be to do worse in terms of complications of COVID-19. In the UK, uh, we've been compiling evidence to try and um, quantify the level of risk that individuals have in terms of their risk of both catching COVID-19 and um, becoming seriously ill as a result of it. And the one product has been the idea of a COVID age calculator. It's based in the context of the UK. And so in your different context, you need to think to what extent this is also relevant within our context. And, and uh, I don't suggest this as some sort of um, universal uh, approach, but it does highlight the importance of thinking about individual susceptibility. Uh, this is helpful for individuals to be aware of their risks, but also for um, workplaces, for employers to think about uh, measures that are necessary depending on the risk of individuals. So the concept is that we all have a COVID age. We start off with our biological age and then depending on other factors, we add or subtract years. So uh, for, for women who are present, uh, the good news is that you take eight years off your biological age uh, because of the significantly reduced risk of being seriously ill with COVID because of your XX chromosomes. There also seems to be an ethnicity factor. Uh, and so compared to white uh, Caucasian individuals, those who are from an Asian or black ethnicity, there's an increased risk that's been seen in terms of in, in the UK. I'm interested to know any other reflections on that. There are also issues of uh, in terms of body mass index. So people that are significantly overweight are doing a lot worse in terms of their risk of becoming seriously ill. And then on the right hand side of this slide, a number of different conditions where there's an associated increase in risk. And I think the important point here is that for some conditions that we thought were per perhaps um, uh, in, involved risk, uh, like having high blood pressure, if that high blood pressure is well controlled, there's no increased risk. If you have mild asthma, there's only a small increase in risk compared to those who are more seriously affected. So um, I've labored that for a little bit, but it means that you could potentially have a 45 year old man in, the, in your workplace who has a higher COVID age than a 65 year old woman because of different ethnicity uh, associated um, health problems and other comorbidities. So just simply saying people over a certain age shouldn't be at work or, or whatever is a, a misunderstanding of the individual vulnerability to risk that we now know. And in the UK, we then have the potential to put people in different vulnerability categories. Uh, this, I think, is particularly uh, uh, for the UK setting. Um, but you can imagine, depending on your background prevalence of COVID-19, depending on your personal uh, COVID age, you, you, there may be a different approach in terms of your exposure to risk. We're coming close to landing. I recognize that, that, that uh, I, I'm close to the end of my time, but just a few words about ensuring safe international travel. Where there's been quite a lot of restriction in terms of access to healthcare because the healthcare has been focused on COVID-19 care, um, there, there is the concern that a, a number of people have health problems that they're not aware of or haven't been well managed in the preceding months. So perhaps there's, it's even more important than ever to assess and get assessed and checked out in terms of your health before you take up international travel. In addition, you may end up in a destination in the world where there is a COVID hotspot, or perhaps a, a sudden peak in cases, and you find yourself unable to access healthcare in that place. Uh, or um, it, by going to that health facility, you are exposing yourself to the risk of COVID infection. So a pre-travel health risk assessment is perhaps even more important than usual. But we need to think ahead 
contingency plans is the name of the game and to be aware of what the entry requirements and the quarantine measures are depending on where you're going and these are some sources of information and you'll get these slides after the webinar which you could do your own research in terms of your own um, travel plans or those of those that you care for uh, so up-to-date travel advice this is again a source from the UK that is kept up to date on a daily basis has some excellent resources in terms of infection risk don't just think about your travel risk en route but think about your destination well, this is the last slide, actually, and it's a, it, um, uh, it, it just talks about the idea of an immunity passport. Um, for several uh, weeks now, people have been hoping that uh, we can uh, get to the stage where we're doing an antibody test that shows that someone has antibodies to COVID-19 as a way of saying, OK, these people have had the infection, they're now safe and they can't get the infection again. A little bit like we've used the idea of hepatitis B antibody levels as a, uh, for healthcare workers and other aid and mission workers. Unfortunately, although there's some theoretical advantage in the idea of a, an antibody test for COVID-19, there are significant number of problems with it at the moment. So we are a long way from having something that's in effect an immunity passport, something that you will show to customs or to a new employer to say, OK, I can't get COVID because I've got an antibody response. There's a lack of performance data and we don't yet know if having antibodies means that you're immune. We don't know how long the antibodies persist for. And there's some big concerns about the the quality of some of the self test kits that are available. That's a, a, a rather unusual place to finish uh, my presentation, but I'm really looking forward to the remaining uh, 25 minutes or so as I hear your comments and try and answer some of your questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but it's been a, a, a real privilege to share my thoughts with you and I look forward to the next few minutes. Thank you very much, Simon, for a, a very comprehensive overview and I certainly learned a lot of, of new things. So please do send in your questions now. Uh, the first one we've got here, Simon, is what does it mean now that work is done online? Any practical tips for people going from uh, in the transition to digital in terms of things they should look out for? Yeah, it's, it's a, a, a big topic. Uh, Thrive Worldwide, who I work for, is actually a, we're really a virtual organization. We, 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 we work in a number of different countries. So in our two and a half years, we've been developing ways of being able to still work as a team, but, but not um, in the same workplace. And I think we've learned some things along the way. Um, the, the, the need to continue that levels of communication between people. So it, again using uh, what's available in terms of having regular um, connections with people uh, during the day in terms of uh, messaging and, and and what have you but having regular uh, we have uh, twice weekly meetings where we all come together and we're using the zoom platform um, I, I think people are finding it it actually it very tiring to spend the day on these um, platforms and so the, the, the need to keep uh, still some healthy rhythms of work and rest to uh, 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 for, for many people their commute to and from work was a was part of their exercise uh, regime so how are you going to to reapply the idea of, of exercise into a routine that's really um, that the only exercise you have is walking up the stairs to your office from where you've come from so there are a number of factors where you're wanting to just try and reproduce what what are the what are the, the factors that that make it being healthy to be together in one place and how you're going to reproduce those within this new um environment so uh, lots to talk about but those are some of the things question about unemployment rates uh, going up and will be higher in many countries after this any advice on 
uh, to people facing unemployment, particularly here. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we're, we're just, we're just awaiting to see what's going to happen. I, I think, I think this is, I, I, I think, I think that's why we, uh, governments that are thinking of the bigger picture and not just focused on COVID nineteen have have some wisdom because it it the the, the consequences of unemployment of uh, of uh, actually potentially uh, could outweigh the impact of COVID nineteen itself and so. Um, the, the need to get um, um, parts of the economy back working and mm -hmm. and and managing risk, uh, but but not being a sort of afraid to do nothing because there are a certain amount of risk, I think is key. Um, I, I, I think I, I mean I I think these are complex issues, but I, I think the 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 wonderful thing as being of being Christian people is that there's no in in that sense there's no such thing as as unemployment in that in that in that each day uh, god gives us um work to do and and i think even if you've got a period of time when you're going to be out of work or people that you're advising are out of work these are not days to be wasted there are opportunities for training to 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 so that perhaps you need to be redeployed into other areas but um i i think i think having that that perspective i think it might be some comfort to some people so unemployed doesn't mean unoccupied by any means it might be god's yeah. opportunity for you to do something that he has yeah. Yeah. planned for you you started off simon right at the beginning talking about the health risks of isolation and working at home uh, does that mean that we should be trying to go to work at all if at all possible rather than working at home if at all possible. So how, how does one balance the, the risk of being exposed to the virus and going to work on the one hand with the risks to one's health and prolonged working at yes. home in isolation? I, I mean, I think it was appropriate in, in the kind of the emergency, the acute phase of this to um, have this as a, a mantra, work at home uh, if at all possible. I, th I think I think things are going to change in terms of because I think organisations will recognise and and individuals will recognise the importance of actually being being together in the same place. And I think I think it's we 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 do know an awful lot now about the virus and its means of transmission. So uh, sometimes there are some unfounded fears that people have that need to be overcome within a uh, within the UK context. So I, I can't talk more widely. Uh, a, a kind of office environment that there is no reason why an organization can't put um, measures in place that make it a, a safe uh, with with managed risk in terms of uh, of people being within the workplace even if people have relatively high individual susceptibility themselves because you you, you can reproduce um, measures like the like social distance and and change the way that the the workplace is set up. I, I recognise that doesn't work in all settings, but uh, I I think uh, we need to start within the context in 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 uh, in much of Europe to start thinking. Actually, we can meet physically, and actually there are some added benefit of doing that. And so I I think I think yes, we we've learned that we can do some things remotely, but I think there is something. I think really important about getting together. Uh, that that's a, that's a personal view actually, but I suspect uh, there will be some basis for that in in the coming weeks. The so question we've got quite a few li uh, listeners in Southeast Asia. The question from Indonesia: uh, lots of colleges and schools with dormitories, uh, many with fifteen to twenty students sleeping in one room and uh, often eating together in not a big room. Now, the people listening to this will be sharing the presentation tomorrow with theological school leaders, and they're anticipating this question. So what advice would you have uh, about dormitories in particular and the risk? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I mean, I think thinking in terms of the, the context in Southeast Asia, I think the Certainly, certainly, there, there, there are, there's no doubt that that a, a dormitory uh, experience ha will will have significant risks 
if there is a significant amount of uh, of cases, COVID-19 cases within the uh, local population. And so the uh, so to be looking at what the the current levels are in terms of daily cases within a particular country and even a more granular level will give you some idea of the kind of risks that will be taken. But if there's if there's no alternative to that kind of uh, living condition, then I think there's significant risk of transmission one person to another if there are people that um, the, the individuals within that context are infected. Um, so, so it's it, it's it's thinking of the context. It's think it's thinking of what is what is open to change or to be adapted what so it, it has to be pragmatic it has to be based in the real world and it has to be weighing up against all the other risks that i was trying to illustrate so there's no doubt that's a set of risk factors because of the close proximity over a, and potentially um in a confined space that needs to be managed but even opening windows um um uh, and increasing ventilation would be a key thing uh, in terms of creating as much distance as possible from individuals, even the proximity of people's faces from others, even during their sleeping hours. So you could you can imagine by being creative, you could reduce that risk. But I think it would be something that would really have to be thought through in some communities. And um, uh, people are deciding that they're, they're joining a bubble together. So the idea of 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 coming into a community and then staying faithful within that community might be a way of managing something like this so that perhaps you have a quarantine period where people enter the theological college for example where you uh, uh, and you get through that quarantine period and then you're able to become part of that community i suspect uh, that could be a very powerful thing um to actually uh, uh manage this um sorry thinking on my feet uh, thank you very much. Uh, you, you talked a bit about ventilation. People are asking, with re respect to indoor activities, particularly in a church, what's the best ventilation? Air conditioning, open windows, uh, and and why? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the the, the if people will need to do their own um, looking into this idea of airborne transmission because it's really just recently been talked about, and I I don't consider myself an expert uh, I, I think natural ventilation is fantastic and uh, and the idea of of outdoor living works really well in certain parts of the world and should be something that we should really encourage um, on the basis of the fact that although our current issue is COVID-19 it's uh, perfectly feasible that we're going to have further uh, respiratory viruses like COVID-19 in the future that we're going to have to manage. Um, uh, I, I think I think the air conditioning, uh, as I was saying, it's possible to uh, alter the, the the way the air conditioning is is produced. And, and I think so air conditioning per se doesn't necessarily mean that that's a, um, a safe and effective. It, it's there. There'll be measures in terms of to what extent um, the air conditioning system is drawing fresh air in and to what extent it's just recirculating air that's um, uh, already in the room. Um, so so yeah, I don't think it's either or, um, I, I think, and I think you need to look in your personal context at, at what's most appropriate. Come back to this concept of COVID age, which you mentioned, and uh, that was certainly the, new to me in terms of the detailed calculations for working it out but uh, someone's asking here is the COVID age is this related to mortality or to the likelihood of becoming infected or to to both uh, so the if, if, if so I would encourage people to to check out the the website that, that has the the basis for it the, the website argues that it's both so um, it's both in terms of becoming infected and the severity of uh, of or the, the risk of complications and therefore case fatality rates uh, clearly with some conditions um you could see in terms of a kind of thinking through it logically uh, that would make you more susceptible to becoming infected and others that would um perhaps 
um, have more of an impact in terms of your risk of complications. So uh, it it's so I think it's a combination of those things. And I think the important thing is in terms of what the those behind the the tool are saying is that this is not something that's a kind of self help tool that everyone goes and calculates their own risk, but it's part of something that's used by health professionals when they're advising individuals to think about their own vulnerability. Um, and, and it's also not something that should be used by an employer to say, oh, well, you're this, this, this high risk, so that you're, not, you're not coming into the workplace and you're at lower risk, so you should. It, it's, a, it's something to provoke a conversation so that an individual is aware of their susceptibility and can take their own measures, but also an employer can, can be responsible in terms of saying, oh, actually, we recognise we've got people at high risk, so we need to be thinking of what else we can do to mitigate against that. So it's, um, I, I, I think it needs to be, well, I, I'd encourage people to, to look into it more and to think to what extent it's, it's a useful thing within, the, um, within their context. In some ways, I'm wondering, you know, in some ways it's blindingly obvious, sorry, that's a, an English idiom, but, it, but the idea that, um, you know, that, that some people are at higher risk of all sorts of conditions, not just infections, but also non-infectious diseases on the basis of obesity and age and other conditions. But uh, there's those that are behind the tool have been uh, looking at data and seeing what's been happening. So it, 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 it's based on the data we have to date in terms of what's been happening in terms of those that have been more likely to get seriously ill with COVID-19. How recent and accurate is this work on COVID age? So, so, so it's growing all the time. So uh, if you go to the website, you see actually there, there are levels, just as you'd expect in terms of uh, levels of, of kind of robustness in terms of those individual scores. So it might say for some moderately robust or very robust. So it, it would vary. Um, I, I, th I think that doesn't stop it being a, a useful tool if it's being used in the right kind of right kind of way. And the, there's evidence coming in all the time. So the the calculator is being is being modified depending on new information that's come through. There's something that's been something similar that's been worked up in the States, I understand. Um, um, so that other, other other researchers have been looking at this concept. Now, in the health service, for example, in the UK, and there are what a million people working in the health service in the UK, and it seems that often quite an arbitrary measure of age has been applied in deciding whether people are vulnerable or not. Do you do you think we should be using a more objective measure like this in in deciding who to protect? Well, it it certainly shows up the the. the the flaw of using it and, and the, the unfairness of, of, of having discrimination on the basis of biological age. Um, of course, uh, in the UK, we have the Equality Act that looks at protected characteristics. So uh, we also think in terms of disability about not discriminating people on the basis of, of, of a particular physical or mental impairment. So I think, I think it, it is helpful. Um, um, because I, I and and just shows the, the the fallacy of saying actually because someone's a certain age it is something actually we we know don't we and I think it's well recognised um, uh, 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 and, and and so yes age is a poor discriminator of risk uh, for all sorts of uh, issues and uh, uh, um, health problems. Um, it's a it's a it's a combination of a number of factors, and then you end up with some sort of composite overall risk. Uh, and this is, I guess, COVID age is an example of that um, for this specific um, pandemic. In the, in the church context, Simon, a lot of countries now where numbers are dropping, uh, people are going back to churches following various guidelines. Yeah. What do you think are the most important? guidelines for churches to follow to reduce spread of infection I mean it seems at one extreme you can introduce so many regulations that people wonder about whether it's even worth going to, yeah. to church or yeah. the other you're exposing people to risk I, I, I think I think one of the fundamental principles is would be to have a cautious step-by-step -step approach 
Uh, and so I think it's great to put in some sensible measures that are that keep the risk of COVID well away. Um, so you're talking about small numbers meeting in well ventilated buildings um, that you're having the precautionary principle to start with about congregational singing, uh, which which may have increased risk to it that you to start with when you're meeting, you avoid um, unnecessarily complications to uh, for example that you would decide not to um, to have uh, food and drink when you meet to start with so I think it I think I think I think we would do well and, and in my local church situation we're, we're setting up to start meeting again I think it I think it's so that people can grow in confidence that actually with some very sensible um, common sense measures you can actually safely meet and effectively meet together and then i think we grow in our confidence um i, I think it, it it depends a lot on the background populate uh, um uh, prevalence of covid19 and so as uh, where areas have hot spots and further spikes uh, measures might need to be uh, drawn back again um but i think it it, it is the time to start um, meeting together but thinking about physical distance, um, um, thinking about um, basic uh, hand hygiene, um, thinking about the whole cleaning procedures within the church building and, and ventilation. So um, wide open doors, uh, open windows, even meeting outside uh, if, it's, if the weather is suitable. A lot, a lot of us are, of course, working in healthcare environments where the risk of airborne infection is high because there are patients who are infected, mm. perhaps staff as well. What's the best way of reducing airborne transmission in a hospital environment? Yeah. So um, th there is there is some important um, work to be done in terms of air quality and air conditioning and those kind of aspects. So on an environmental level, but I think that there is certainly a, a place for face masks uh, and and visors. So I haven't um, spent much of my time focusing on that. And in many parts of the world, there are a lot more of established part of the the the, the way of combating uh, COVID nineteen. Um, so I, I think face masks have a have a uh, an important role to play, uh, and uh, and just as I as I talk to health professionals, it really is possible to um, to to employ PPE in a safe and effective way, and and many health workers are continuing to remain um, without the virus and without antibodies for the virus. Um, so I think I think it's important to do all that that you can. It's 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 all about. Uh, reducing your exposure to the to the pathogen um, uh, and and so even if it's not a hundred percent effective um, it, it's it's going to make a difference in terms of the, the risk to, to, uh, of you actually becoming ill because of the infection and and how severely you ill depending on your infection dose so it's all all of these measures even though of a, in and of themselves they're not hundred percent effective together they amount a robust defense against um, the virus and the worst worst complications of it. Thanks, Simon. Perhaps a, a final question now, just going right back to the beginning of your talk, where you said there were two incredibly important principles, the power of good work for health and well-being, and then the danger of being out of work, both for health and well-being. And, there are going to people, be people who inevitably will be made redundant uh, through this process. What would mm. be your best occupational health advice uh, to people who have been made redundant about how they can make the best use of their time, which might be quite prolonged yeah. away? Yes, yes. So I, I think it's, it is really going back to first principles. I, I think that what I was excited about was to find a, a speciality in medicine where um, my understanding of what it means to be human made in God's image so chimed with what the research was saying in terms of what was good for us in a holistic sense, work on the one hand 
and, and the hazard of, of not work. So f f for me, it's thinking, OK, uh, I'm not in work. How can I be a steward of God's uh, good creation? How can I um, still serve and, and be productive and creative? So um, I, I recognize that that there's a need to put food on the table. So I don't want to be over simplistic about it. But but there is there is uh, I think you, you said, Peter, you, know, you can be unemployed, but not unoccupied. And, and I think that's important in terms of how maintaining our sense of of who we are and and our value uh, is is keeping active, keeping regular routines, thinking of new ways of of expanding our understanding. Um, it is an opportunity. Uh, I think I think keeping ourselves physically well is also really critical. So I, I would, if I was out of work for a period of time, I would major on um, being as physically fit as I could be. I would be exercising more. I'd be keeping a regular routine, even though there was no reason to get out of bed in the morning, perhaps for a particular job. I'd be getting out. I'd be setting the alarm clock and getting out of bed. I'd be having my uh, quiet time and praying and reading my the scriptures because that's fundamental to life, not just because I'm working or not working. Thank you very much, Simon. We've been listening to Simon Clift on an occupational medicine perspective to uh, COVID-19. So thank you very much again, all of you for joining us on ICMDA webinars. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, thank you to all our translators. God bless you and we'll see you again soon.